Tonight, Boundaries of Fear, a week-long Assignment 7 report on Boston gangs. How many gangs are there? How violent are they? And is the situation getting out of control? Over the last six months, News 7's Lester Strong and Miles O'Brien have talked with gang members, the police, and the community. Tonight, in part one, they show us what it's like on the streets. <laughs> Cash flow extreme, dress code supreme, vocabulary obscene, definition street player, you know who I mean. This here is, signifies so much territory. We've been strong. We gonna Just stay strong. Because we stick together. High nah, rank officials of our city streets make millions all triggered by electric beats. They look at the drug trade as an easy way out for us. If things get hot, they will pull a gun. Pray. You got your Uzis, your Tech 9s, your Mac 10s. You can get those? <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yeah, this is Boston, man. We're the whole Interville gang out there. Something's going on. Something frightening is going on in Boston. Police are struggling for control of the streets as violent, well-armed youth gangs flourish. You got to be with somebody. You can't be solo, man. Just not happening no more. It's like I said, it's Boston, man. Police say there are between 15 and 20 gangs, crews, or posses, with about 400 members scattered across Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. While most gangs are involved in cocaine sales, police say the trouble starts with kid stuff. Over people getting radio stolen, girls getting slapped, someone saying something to the wrong girl, sneakers being stepped on. I mean, uh, that's the gamut of, uh, of the reasons for some of these shootings. Yo, we, we'd rather do it with yeah. these fists, but you know, that ain't the way it is. Because the slam you at the wall. wall. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> the other guys, they, they, always always use, they always use weapons. And innocent people, often the victims. Among them, 12-year-old Tiffany Moore and 43-year-old Inacio Mendez. They were shot and killed last year in gang-related violence. In both cases, police say Mendez's 19-year-old stepson, Swervin Mervyn Reese, was the intended target. Reese is a well-known member of one of Roxbury's most active street gangs. But homicides are only a part of the picture. The amount of armed assaults, the shootings, uh, the stabbings, and the amount of arrests that we've had from people who we know to be involved in some of these particular gangs uh, is at an all-time high. So is police presence in the area where the gangs fight their battles. We know who these people are, we know how many are in each group. We uh, have uh, uh, share information with other units in the city and we stay on top of them. Please. But while police say the gangs are firmly under control, the cycle of violence is becoming firmly entrenched. Why do you shoot at other gangs? Huh? For protection, man. Yeah? They be doing stuff to us, so we just get back, man. While gangs are not new to these streets, the level of violence is. Where there were fists, there are now knives. Where there were chains, there are now semi-automatic weapons. Lester Strong spoke to some people who live here and to some gang members who say all of this is drawing new boundaries of fear. In or out of a gang, lessons on the street come quickly and are often painful. How many of you here have seen somebody get shot? I've seen my father get shot. We was coming from off the train and somebody pulled the gun up and they shot up in the air and the cops came, and one, one certain cop thought that my father was the one who did it, and he shot my father in the chest. And? And after that, he went to the hospital. And then when he got out, when he got out, a few days later, he passed away. With the prevalence of guns and gangs has come a sense of siege for many community residents. Bullets don't have names on there when you're shooting at random. It could be anybody, really. And that's scary, that you could be standing at a door or window or something and you could get killed. That is really frightening. You can't even walk to the store nowadays without a bullet flying past you. These are the same kind of fights that any youngster would have 20 or 30 years ago, but there were never any weapons involved. And it's drugs that has been the infusion now of weapons. Why? Why did you guys get involved in the game? Money, I guess. What do you mean money? Money to get what I want. Get my clothes, my jewelry. You know, just have the things that I want. You make too much money not to get involved. When Burger King or McDonald's want to pay you $5 an hour, when you can go outside. 
But not all youngsters have succumbed to the seduction of fast money. I was going to school the other day, and there was this man, and he asked me, do I want to sell drugs for him? I told him he better take his drug and stick it up his butt. <laughs> 16, you think, you think you're pretty bad, huh? Oh. You think you're bad, you can walk out here and... No, I'm home. Do As enforcement want, gets huh? tighter, some complain police like? have crossed over home. into harassment, huh? saying even certain hats and sneakers can trigger suspicion. This is a war, and you, and you pick your enemy. If we're, if we're out here with hats and sneakers, then we're the enemy, and that's how they look at us. But despite what they see as gangs on one side and some overzealous cops on the other, many residents say they're sticking it out. And I'm not leaving Roxbury. I love Roxbury. I, I, I love the potential of Roxbury. And I will not be driven out by gangs, and I will not be driven out by the police. And as you can see, the fear is pervasive. It runs deep in the community, from kids in school to the parents at home worried about walking outside. The police say it is possible to control the situation, but they can't do it alone. Artie? Lester, we heard well, the gentleman a moment ago say he, he loves Roxbury. He's not going to leave. What do he and other people in the community do to stop the violence? There are many, many residents who feel exactly that way, and they have begun, in effect, a Marshall Plan, R.D., for so many attempts to to, with the churches and the community organizations to really affect the plan to do something. The real question now is whether or not they can pull all of these resources together and focus that energy in a very strong and a very constructive way. And I think that we're going to see Mayor Flynn try to focus that energy. And for some people, a life and death question. Absolutely. Thank Tonight, we continue our look at the gang situation in Boston. Part two of an Assignment 7 report, Boundaries of Fear, puts the violence on the streets of Boston into perspective by looking at another city with a gang problem. News 7's Miles O'Brien will take us to Los Angeles, a city under siege. Some 70,000 gang members control the streets there, a warning sign for Boston. But first, Lester Strong tells us the gang violence here has changed, but it is not uncontrollable. Yeah, it's been quiet, Bob. You see, it's all good. I don't know. Clearly, gang activity has crystallized in the neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And with it has come a level of violence unlike any other section in Boston. But are gangs forming in other parts of the city as well? Take South Boston, for example. It's a neighborhood with pockets of low-income families and a history of teenagers protecting their turf. But when I talk with youngsters in Southie, they tell me things are different here. There's no gangs in here. No gangs? No. No, no, no. They used to be, kind of. Not anymore, though. There's a lot of fighting. There's not much guns. But the drug problem is here. Heroin. Heroin. $30 a bag. How much? $30 a bag. Heroin. People bring $100 down and get three bags. Mm. In Charlestown, the response is much the same. Kids from Newtown can freely go to Hay Square and Main Street with no problem. But there are still fights. You know, there's trouble around here. You know, this, this place ain't a bunch of angels around here, but they keep, you know, kill each other or anything like that, you know? At least you can walk around, you know, whatever kind of sneaker you want to wear, you know, like in Roxbury, places like that, you can't even wear certain kinds of sneakers. Perhaps Chinatown is the most curious area of all. Like the North End, highly organized gang activity has been well documented here. The most visible example is Stephen Say, reputed leader of the Pingon gang and a Chinatown restaurant owner. He's part of an Asian gang connection which accounts for 42% of the heroin smuggled into the East Coast. Our Chinatown here serves as, as, as an entry point for some of the drugs as we've seen last year from the Orient, comes in here, is organized by these individuals, certain members of the Pingon gang, uh, and then redistributed throughout New England to New York City, some of it stays here. Obviously, you know, there the are local people involved, but I don't, I don't believe that, you know, that there are local gangs as such. Chinatown is the only section of the city where youngsters decline to talk to us about the gang problem in their neighborhood. There was some concern for reprisals, but you also got the sense they wanted the adults to handle the questions. I think basically why you don't see the, the heavy grain crowd is because we are, the Chinese community is still family oriented and the family still, you know, still has control of, of the youngsters. Of course, organized crime in Chinatown and other sections of Boston is not a new threat to local and federal authorities. What is new is the proliferation of youth gangs, with about 150 kids being the hardcore of the problem. 
That's not so in Los Angeles, where thousands of gang members literally control sections of the city and the county. Miles O'Brien talked with LA officials who say they're not trying to eliminate gangs, but simply trying to contain their deadly influence. That? Yeah, in the cars. We shot at the cars. We shot at the cars. It's a 410 shotgun, a 3030 rifle, and a 15-year-old gang member. It adds up to trouble on the streets of South Central Los Angeles. You want to kill people with that? We have to. Why? And they mess with us? Because it, they already shot two of our homeboys down. That's why. Yeah. Not it's even. Too late. Like, it's too late three, for them to stop three, now. Four days ago, Unlike Boston, it's too late for Los Angeles to stop its gang problem easily. Instead of 400, there are at least 70,000 gang members here, and they control too many streets. We are the Hoover, 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 Hoover criminals. <laughs> A gang called the 74 Hoover Crips claims this piece of Los Angeles. Their spray-painted death threats to police and rival gangs cover the apartment building they commandeered and ransacked and many nearby walls. Why do you put it up in the wall like that? They were our body, I see it, you know, let people know that we don't get along with them. And when you don't get along with them, what happens? It was life or death, man, you have to do or die. I got shot, <laughs> then I had somebody had to pay, so I just went back and shot, who, I don't care who did it, it was enemies, so they got shot. Somebody got shot, shot me, shot them back. Just keeps going. Uh -huh. <laughs> The human toll is staggering. Last year, more than 450 people were shot and killed in gang-related incidents in Los Angeles County. That was a record. And so far this year, the new graves are being dug at an even faster rate. And 60% of those being buried are innocent victims. I used to believe that it would come to an end. Now, because of the skeleton, I don't know if it's going to come to an end. If it does, I don't know if it will come in my lifetime. Sergeant Joe Holmes of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department says police are doing all they can, but many here say the situation is out of control. In Boston, the gang problem is not out of control, but the reason for the escalating violence is the same. It's all about this, homeboy. The rocks, man. It's all about these rocks. Today, drugs and money have fueled a war which began over turf and manhood. It's so intense now, many feel they have no choice. Most kids, man, don't, don't want to be in gangs, but to be like, that's how you got to grow up, because you got to be like, you got to prove yourself, man, to your fellow people, understand? Because if you ain't got your neighborhood, you ain't got nothing. Never in life would you stop. Unless they drop a bomb right now. It's the only way you'll stop. But many here believe drastic action would not be necessary today if L.A. heeded the warning signs years ago. It was coming. They saw it. And they just let it slide, and it slid right into where it is today. Theron Cook is with a grassroots group called Community Youth Gang Services. Last month, three members of the group came to Boston and held a series of seminars on how to deal with the gang problem. Their advice, in a nutshell, prevent it before it becomes a police matter. That means reaching kids in the classrooms and in after-school programs before they join a gang, because in L.A. they know all too well, once a teen is sucked into the gang world, it's all but impossible to reach him. RD? Miles, Boston is not Los Angeles. Is it fair to compare the two? Well, there are certain things about L.A. that make it unique, and uh, Boston will never be L.A. in some ways. But some of the underlying reasons, the drugs, the weapons, and the breakdown in the family structure are common to both L.A. and Boston, so the comparison is valid there, anyhow. All right. Thank you, Miles O'Brien. I Tonight, part three of Boundaries of Fear, an Assignment 7 report on the problem of Boston gangs, how sophisticated they've become, and why. Lester Strong and Miles O'Brien report on the deadly combination of crack cocaine, guns, and gangs, and how the three feed off each other. Police! Police, don't move! Freeze. Don't Freeze. move! Freeze. Don't, don't move! Down on the ground! Freeze. Down on the ground! Boston police are trying to beat down an epidemic they hoped they could avoid. This food ain't the only thing we've been cooking, man. Eh? Well, I ain't gonna lie and say I don't get high. I mean, jeez. But I, I don't sell them. While they only found traces of narcotics and some drug paraphernalia on this night, members of the Boston Police Citywide Any Crime Unit say this is a busy crack house. That seems to be the, uh, the drug of the day uh, this year. Anyway, seen a lot more of that than we have in the last couple of years. Tell me about crack cocaine. Is there a lot of that? Yep. We all sell it. You all sell it? Yep. A lot of it? Yep. Boston street gang members sell it on the corners which they claim is home turf. Turf which is protected with bullets and bravado. I'm all like, I'm standing right here making my money and everything, you know. Somebody come along, they start messing with my money, so I got to off them, you know. So, you know, like that again, it's all around money. Yeah. Off them. Huh? Shoot them. 
<laughs> if necessary, yeah. Have you shot people? <laughs> no more questions, huh? The stakes are high. Depending on the size, rocks of cocaine can sell for twenty to forty dollars a piece. They make a thousand dollars a day if they want to sell sell enough, you know. And they look at look at the drug trade as an easy way out for them. Should be three hundred and forty-three dollars there. Three hundred's wrapped up. Forty-three is for me. It's an easy way to a thick bankroll, plenty of gold chains, hundred-dollar sneakers, and a well-equipped Suzuki. They call them high rollers and high rollers are finding safety in numbers. You buy yourself and say you got a nice chain on, a, a nice watch or whatever, somebody else from over there, they'll take it from But if you like, you know, five or six guys, it's, that's like improbable for anybody to do. For police, finding the dope and making the arrest is becoming more challenging. Younger gang members serve as lookouts and carriers for older dealers. Bleach is often used to destroy evidence and beepers ensure mobility. What's this for work? Nah, it don't even work. I found that. You found it? Yeah. It well, don't work. Turn it in. Turn it in? Yeah. Yeah, they said I can get twenty dollars for it. I was gonna do that. Yeah. It was, huh? As the marketing of narcotics becomes more sophisticated, so too does the means of protecting the merchandise. As Lester Strong discovered, finding the right firepower is just a textbook case of supply and demand. If drug sales is the business, guns are the tools of the trade and they are pouring into Boston with increasing regularity and in growing quantities. It's like getting a bag of potato chips. It's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, people, here's five sixteens that they'll give to you. It's like, you know, drugs over guns. It's like, it's a deal there, you see what I'm saying? The weapons can come from a variety of sources, commonly from unsuspecting gun owners. The majority of the firearms we see on the street are ones that were not imported from out of state, but stolen in house breaks or car breaks. But the weapons demand has created a growth industry, one that has spawned a type of entrepreneur, lured by the money and undeterred by the risk. This man, who asked that his identity and voice be concealed, says he's made regular gun runs to the South. Well, you get somebody to go down South that has family down there or whatever, you know, and you get your family, one of your family's friends to get it for you, you know, somebody that's a hunter. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire again, that's another major, what, another major hunting state. In New Hampshire and many southern states, little more than proof of residency and age is necessary to purchase a rifle or a handgun. The requirement in Massachusetts is much more stringent. The most popular gun on the street right now is either your 9 millimeters, or your, your 38, your 9 millimeters, and your 45. Nobody's into the smaller handguns. Now, mostly anybody who's into guns want a gun that when they shoot you, they can stop you. We haven't had any significant increase in the uh, uh, assault type or machine gun type weapons. Basically, the majority of firearms we seize are on the handgun. And when you talk to gang members, they say there is a practical reason for avoiding assault weapons. They're all big, hard to hide. They like the little Mac 10s, 9s, Uzis, you know, some small that you could just carry. Just, you know, shoot off as much rounds as you would need. And the sophisticated firepower has heightened the threat to law enforcement officers. You have a weapon with a 30 round clip, you're executing a search warrant, you could wipe out a, a squad of drug control officers. They were designed for warfare. They weren't designed for an, an urban environment. The deadly combination of drugs and guns could make for a volatile mixture. A recent example is Santa Myers, a 25-year-old Roxbury mother shot in the chest trying to protect her son and nephew from a gang shootout at a neighborhood park. I guarantee you, every week to every two weeks, you're going to hear about a killing or a shootout. Guarantee it, and it's already started. If will and determination is going to be any criteria at all, we are more firmly committed than ever before in the city of Boston dealing with these problems. Every effort to help put an end to the violence counts. Mayor Ray Flynn is trying to organize a youth volunteer program this summer with people willing to work with the city's youth.
He needs 5,000 volunteers. If you're interested, you can call the mayor's office. Obviously, he and the community at large have their work cut out for them. As you saw, guns and drugs are pouring into Massachusetts at a very fast rate. Artie? And the question is, what can be done about stopping the weapons? Well, you know, there's differing opinions, but I think that everyone would agree that any change has to come at the national level to be able to coordinate the effort. I think it's just going to have to be the federal government that does something. And politically, that's a very tough issue. Very tough. Tonight, part four of Boundaries of Fear, an Assignment 7 report on Boston gangs, looks at the reasons why kids join gangs. Miles O'Brien and Lester Strong report a lack of education is part of the problem. Others who are close to the crisis say it's a lack of love. Children aren't born into gangs, but a series of circumstances and events appear to make some kids more prone to a gang lifestyle than others. Most experts agree one central and critical factor is the quality of home life. I don't have no mother, father, sisters, brothers, aunties, or uncles. The gang was my family. You know, I felt those were the only people I could tell my problems to. A strong family, a good father, a good mother can keep a kid out of that, but it takes a lot of love. Every hardcore member I've known has had a real broken up home, and this is how they found a way to get attention and stuff. Add education to that equation. There appears to be a relationship between a youngster's gang involvement and his ability to succeed in a school system. Urban schools all over the country, certainly Boston, we all know we've got a problem there. We've got a 50% dropout rate. They're not functioning. Usually they're out of school at the time they're coming into DYS, and they're three to four grades below their, their peers in terms of computing or, uh, or literacy. Um, they're kids who have very, very few marketable skills. And with reduced skills come limited opportunities, some kids reaching for whatever they can get. Somebody said this to me the other day, he said, he was fighting with the only stick they left him, see? It means if you take everything else away from us, we gotta do something to get money, to get that nice car, to have that nice house. And when the options are risky and often violent, youngsters find protection from others in the same predicament. It's just, you know, a group of kids hanging together and they all just start selling drugs together and drugs and money's like a common bond between friends. Gangs are a self-contained culture with their own language, symbols, and rules. Miles O'Brien found out that if you misread those signs or breach the rules even unknowingly, it could cost you your life. Cruising for bruising, I'm taking no crap. Pipe bomb in my trunk, got a nine in my lap. On Intervale Street, it's Adidas sneakers. It's a bell only. Yeah. Adidas, hold on. I'm laying for a spraying. Tonight there's no plan. The posse's most strapped tonight. The crew's weighing. On Humboldt Avenue, it's Raiders cap. This, this is Humboldt, buddy. Yeah, Humboldt nation. Raiders. Dust is burning, the steering wheel's turning. I'm out of week, I'm already earning. On Castlegate Road, it's troop jackets. See, like this ring, this watch and everything, you know, like, yeah. it pit this, you know, like Castlegate. It's true. Recognition. Gang members say that's what it's all about. Recognition, respect, acceptance, and love. But we just oh, yeah. like one big family, friends, you know, friends that just all came together and just started hanging around here together. And so now they say we're a gang. Well, tell me about it. Yo, these are my brothers. Huh? This ain't no gay, this is a family. It's just your friends. A bunch of your friends you grew up with. Yeah. You just be hanging with them. It's a family with an intricate subculture. Sneakers hanging from trees and phone wires signify the boundaries of territory. The graffiti, a roster of infamy for all to read and heed. In these outlaw families, loyalty runs deeper than morality. Hey, me, loyalty so, is more important you know, like, when there's trouble. Myself. So I can't be by myself, so I got my boys in there. Like, if anything happens, you know, like, they gonna be back, they got my back. You see how they, they up down the corner now, you know? And when their boys in trouble, they're in the courtrooms too. It's part of a criminal game of all for one and one for all. Some guys just get a gun and feel like they're, you know, Superman and just want to shoot everybody. That's not true. What happens if somebody shoots one of your guys? What are you going to do about it? Uh, I, I say no comment. Yo, put your hands on the wall. Too. Come on, come over here. But Boston police will comment. They say this gang is one of the city's most violent. Their rap sheets filled with drug and gun arrests. To match the bravado and to live up to what to the, the picture that they're projecting of themselves, they have to finish the deed by shooting somebody. 
Juvenile probation officer Billy Stewart worries about the children who play in the shade of the sneaker trees and in the shadows of the graffiti-filled walls. Being up on the wall isn't that smart because you're advertising now and you're telling everybody that you're going to break a law and you're telling everybody that sooner or later you're going to get arrested. But the gang family is molding another generation. I'm living large as possible, posse unstoppable. This is my speed is awesome. thing. This is the best thing. Money you walk, you short, you right from the clink. Come on. As time evolves yeah, on, hurting, nigga. they get crazier and crazier. Yep. You know, they grow up and try to spill in our shoes and stuff. And it gets worse. Oh, posse crew, we're going to break through. You fight for your speed? <laughs> Huh? It depends what kind of fight you're talking about. Power. I know you want to try it, but check it out. Money can buy it. I just tell people don't get into them. Don't be jealous of what other people got. You know, don't try to be a big man and stuff because you're not going to survive long trying to be like that. We'll wait and see who gets the last laugh. We'll have the power. power. Older gang members call the younger kids wannabes. Police say the wannabes are often the most dangerous gang members because they feel compelled to prove themselves. Ironically, most of the older gang members we spoke with, often in jail, said if they could reach the wannabes, they'd tell them, don't be. Sadly, the wannabes see who's on the street, not who's in the cell block or a cemetery plot. R.D.? What's being done to get the message to those kids? Not enough. They need alternatives. They need places to go after school, and there are not enough places. And some of the places that are available are just as dangerous as the streets. Okay. Thank you, Miles O'Brien. Tomorrow at 6 on Boundaries of Fear, a look at the franchising of Los Angeles gangs. Tonight, part 5 of Boundaries of Fear, an Assignment 7 report on gangs and how they are spreading across the country. Lester Strong and Miles O'Brien report on how Hollywood and the media can make a bad situation worse. Is it cop quick? So it's like this, cuz we all gonna stay together for now. You know what I'm saying? I don't care if motherfuckers from West Side in LA, cuz y'all seen Crip, period. They are Crips, members of the notorious Los Angeles street gang. And this home video shows them planning a series of drive by shootings. They come back to your mouth, you know, like, cuz, oh, we did our thing, we did it cool. Street gangs here are becoming more organized. As the money from illegal drug sales pours in, high rollers are buying legitimate businesses as fronts. Once they start this, they got a way to launder their money. They can build motels, they can build check cashing places, they can build, uh, you know, anything that would legitimately launder money. You know? So it's organized crime. So it's organized crime. And, they, they, and gang members on the street are now becoming foot soldiers in an organized effort to find new markets for crack cocaine sales. We're expanding to Texas, to Seattle, Washington, to Arizona, to Las Vegas. We're expanding. In fact, police say Los Angeles gang members have franchised drug-selling operations in at least 40 other cities, including Oklahoma City. L.A. gangs there are no strangers to law enforcement who fear the problem is escalating. L.A.'s gang war has also come to Omaha, Nebraska, where this fight between Crips and Bloods left one gang member dead. And in Minneapolis, suspected members of the Bloods faced federal charges. Police say they are some of the L.A. gang members who are trying to take over the local drug scene. There is strong financial incentive to leave L.A. If you go to Seattle or you go to Denver or you go to Boston, the, the chances are you can undercut the locals simply because you've got the source. Well, look at the profit, $12,225 for a kilo of coke here. Go to Dallas, sell it for $40,000. Go to Portland, sell it for $30,000. And there are cities such as Minneapolis where it, uh, in a year ago was selling as high as $60,000. But police hope there is another reason. They say their special anti-gang squads are making it harder for gang members to do business in L.A. How old are you? 19. What's your name? Caesar. Don't say that to me, Caesar. You know better than that. Don't talk to me like that. But L.A.'s gain means another city's loss, as gang members export their indiscriminate drive-by violence along with their cocaine. The monsters got more class. And they don't compete with a monster, because see, if the mob wants you, the mob come get you. You know, a gang banger, if they want somebody, they go get anybody. Would you be surprised if they, if they somehow forgot about Boston and, and um, go there. That would probably surprise me a little bit because they're going everywhere else in the country. I don't know why they wouldn't go to Boston. But even if L.A. gang members never surface here in Boston, their reputation precedes them. Lester Strong tells us images of L.A. gang violence are familiar on these streets, 
from Hollywood and through the media, a kind of electronic franchising. The image of gangs has radically changed since the days of West Side Story. Psychopath talking. King of my jungle, just a gangster. Today, the sights and sounds are very different. The 1988 movie Colors has set a new standard for graphically depicting life in L.A. gangs, a portrayal which has a profound impact on millions of inner-city teenagers. Take 16-year-old Stephen Stanley, for example. In 1988, we talked with him about the film. Like, a little bit rowdy because the way the movie is, it tell, it's like rowdiness, and it just gets you started, and your adrenaline, adrenaline starts going. One year later, 17-year-old Stephen Stanley is arraigned in connection with the murder of 16-year-old Clovis Cobb in Roxbury. Just a coincidence, or was media violence just another factor which led Stanley to this end? There's no question in my mind that the problem doesn't exist in Los Angeles. No question in my mind, but I think that Hollywood overdoes it. If they just toned it down a bit and stopped creating all this and perpetuating this violence, I think that maybe these kids could do something constructive and start, instead of watching television and watching how people kill people and how people shoot people. Listen to me, man. No matter what you do, don't ever join a gang. You don't want Even Ice-T, the rap master who did the soundtrack for the film, agrees that the madness has got to stop. Yo, please stop, because I want y'all to live. This is Ice T. Peace. Gunfire rings out in Roxbury tonight. Police report four shootings and say at least one of them is gang related. And even the national and local news media unwittingly convey more than just the facts about gang style violence. <laughs> See when that kid got killed? Yeah. This is an Interville gang. Our kids do look in the newspapers. Um, for the, the gang events that are, that are um, chronicled there or the, the drug arrests and all the rest. And, or on TV, when, when TV is focusing on the gangs. And there's a sense of, um, of accomplishment. I use the initials TV to stand for teen violence because young people see on TV 10,000 violent acts before they're 12 years old. News media calls them a gang. We call it, we call it a posse. We just hang with our friends chilling. They call it a gang. Violence happens, then it's gang war. Our gangs have steadily increased when the coverage of these gangs has increased. Of course, there is another side to all of this, and that's the community. Many fear that reports like ours and others done on gangs and crime only highlight the bad aspects of these communities and fail to mention the good. RD. Well, is there anybody suggesting that we not do stories about these things? Not at all, R.D. I think that what it is is simply a sobering reminder that those of us who have to report these stories do it in as balanced a way and as fair a way, but clearly we've got to report the story. Thank you, Lester Strzok. Those alternatives being offered to stop the situation in Boston from becoming like that in Los Angeles. Many officials in L.A. feel that entire generation is already lost. Miles O'Brien and Lester Strong report on efforts being taken here to get kids off the streets before it's too late. It's called rap or hip hop. But for these members of this musical group called Young Nation, it's a way out of a life of ever-narrowing options. With a recording to their credit, they've managed to escape the gangs, drugs, and violence for now. Was there a temptation to do, to sell drugs? I mean, I understand. It's always still a temptation to sell drugs. They don't want to go get a job at McDonald's while their boys out there riding big Mercedes selling drugs, so they're going to do the same thing. The creation of Young Nation and other groups like it was the brainchild of Emmett Fogart, a youth worker with the Dorchester Youth Collaborative. They're the best individuals to communicate with their peers. These kids are helping other kids. Forever, my brother, you will stand and watch me. The Shavu Roller Rink in Dorchester is an institution, but area residents are divided over whether the teen night spot is a cause or a cure for gang violence. In January, a fight between two rival gangs left one youngster stabbed outside the rink. And the night we were there taping, police arrested a teenager for murder. But when you enter Shavu, your body searched, both males and females, and then hit with a series of rules for proper behavior. 
Chevu's owner insists her roller rink is a force for good in the community. Right now we have a lot of kids just out on the streets with nowhere to go and no direction. And that is really the main problem. Chevu being here is um, really ridiculous to say that we are a problem. We're here to try to give the kids an alternative. Dorcas Dunham has an ally in her efforts to win the respect and trust of these youngsters. The Reverend Bruce Wall is a regular figure here at Chevu, even running Sunday school services for about 20 kids each Sunday morning. And in April, Wall sponsored an anti-gang rally at the club, inviting not only residents, but gang members as well. I think the focus at Chevu is to try to uh, let the youth gang members and let the everyday kids realize that somebody cares for them and that we're willing to do some pretty bold things to reach out to them. According to some youngsters, Chevu is a safe haven in a sometimes hostile environment. I don't ever go outside by myself. It's, it's, too, it's too risky to go out there by yourself. So I don't go outside a lot and everything. I stay in the house. You know, sometimes I come down here and I'll skate and get my mind off of everything. There's no other place around here. Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, High Park, nowhere. There's nowhere else. Here in Boston, many experts still believe that gang violence can be stopped if young people are shown ways to rechannel their energies, very much like what you see here at the Roxbury Boys and Girls Club. But in Los Angeles, an entire generation of gangsters has been written off. Miles O'Brien tells us that in Los Angeles, the only hope now is with the very young. Oh, good, you're right. Where are you from? Gang members' faces often look familiar to Sergeant Joe Holmes, and it's not a coincidence. Okay, then. Talk, talk like the way it's supposed to be. Am I right or wrong? I'm finding myself actually arresting the sons of the fathers that I once arrested. So now we have a second generation in the gang areas. You know, it's just growing up, people growing up, then little kids grow up seeing them, and then, you know, the bad ones follow the trail. One behind the other. Police here in Los Angeles admit there's little they can do. More law enforcement is a temporary solution. If you're going to treat symptoms, yeah. If you're going to treat the, the disease, the problem, I think you've got to start with a young generation and steer them away from this kind of activity. Can someone tell me what could happen to a young person if they were to join a gang? What could happen to a young person? Yes, sir. That's what this class is all about. The 15-week anti-gang curriculum is taught to 4th and 5th graders in Los Angeles public schools. In the areas where the program has been taught since 1982, 99% of the youngsters who went through the original class have never been to juvenile hall, the county jail, state penitentiary. You know what they say, don't hang with the gang. The message falls on receptive ears. Who wishes gangs would go away? No more gangs. But even the most optimistic admit that's not going to happen soon. I think we need to look at some long-term goals, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Another generation? Yes, unfortunately, a lot of people think this generation is lost. At the Tabernacle Faith Baptist Church in Watts, they pray for that lost generation, and they pray for peace on their streets. You can't drive down the street, you know, without practically ducking down in your seat, you know, fear that you're going to get shot at, you know, just for wearing the wrong colors. It took um, over a decade for it to become uh, this excruciating and this bad, so it's going to take a little while for us to clean it up, but we're working on it. This summer, the Reverend Charles Mims is proposing a special Gang Olympics athletic competition to try and encourage gang members to channel their energy away from violence. While it may seem like a naive idea, most people we spoke with agree. Providing alternatives to gangs is a crucial step toward ending them. RD? Miles, we saw that one class underway in Los Angeles. Anything like that in Boston schools? No, nothing exactly like it here. Boston police do have a program in the schools aimed at fifth and sixth graders, but it's strictly on drug abuse, not gangs. All right. Thank you, Miles O'Brien. And tomorrow at 6 on Boundaries of Fear, a look at the problem of keeping those arrested off the streets. The police say they keep seeing the same faces and say they are frustrated with... 
Tonight we see part seven of Boundaries of Fear, an assignment seven report on Boston gangs and the struggle between the cops and the courts. Miles O'Brien and Lester Strong report the police claim they're doing their job, but the courts need to do more. The judges say it's not that simple. Everybody, everybody put your hands on the wall. Everybody get your hands on the wall. Everybody get your hands on the wall. I know where you live. Less than a half hour after a gang-related shooting, and Boston police have found their suspect. Well, this kid's saying you shot him, Lawan. So if you didn't shoot him, you better have something to say to me. When something happens, a shooting, a stabbing, some type of a gang or group-related uh, so-called uh, incident, you know, an, an arrest is made forthwith, you know, usually within the same night. Officer Bobby Murner is assigned to the 22-member citywide anti-crime unit. They are young, aggressive, and they have become Boston's de facto anti-gang squad. Okay, guys, that's it. We get out, we make our presence known, we uh, interrogate them on the street, we pat them down if we think they might be carrying a gun, and we stay on them all the time. I don't want you to put your hands down, all right? Yeah. Understand me? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Keep right up here. This place is getting crazy down here, boys. You been arrested before? Okay. Yes, it gets pass all. No, but you can't have to say for Kayla. Now I'll be able to be. You kill a freaking elephant with this, not a dog. Behaving yourself like the wizard car these days. You have to keep doing it. You know, it's over and over. It's, it's repetitive. It's kind of, it, it gets monotonous after a while, but uh, you got to do it or else these kids are going to take the city over. We're not going to let the problem escalate to that extent in any way, shape or form. In Los Angeles, street gangs have taken over huge chunks of the city. Police there compare their work to warfare. I mean, our mission is real similar, seek out and confront hardcore gang members. Uh, they are easy to find. There are 70,000 gang members in L.A. County. Last year, 452 people were killed in gang-related shootings. Who is here? Police here are outgunned and overwhelmed, but special anti-gang squads still patrol the streets aggressively. I think uh, that we have made an impact on it, though. I really believe that. I believe that if we weren't doing what we're doing right now, that it, the, the problem would be on a much larger scale. The next two will be Indeville, Castle Gate. Boston police say there are only about 400 street gang members in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And they believe the gangs would wither away if they could put 150 hardcore gang leaders behind bars. But aggressive police work is not always followed by aggressive sentencing. I, I beat a lot of my cases. I haven't beat all my cases. They try to do so fast that they don't get enough, you know, evidence. And they try to, you know, be all slick about this and do it fast and don't have no evidence. But we're off the hook, aren't we? The police are off the hook by saying, we did our job, we locked them up, we brought them next door. Police may be off the hook, but they're not necessarily content. Many admit to growing frustration as they repeatedly arrest the same people. They point the finger at the court system. But Lester Strong spoke to one judge who's not willing to take blame. A murder, assault, and battery with a dangerous weapon. The defendant will be bound over uh, through Superior Court. The court is setting a $2,000 cash bail. There's so many cases to be tried, and there are only so many hours in a day. For the judicial system, this is trench warfare. The district courts, the Dorchester court and its counterpart in Roxbury confront a sea of cases each day that tests their limits. There are about 75 cases on, on the list on any given day in the trial sessions around here. And if, uh, if you have 75 cases to try, that's a lot of cases to get through. With four judges. Well, with four, no, that's 75 cases just in the second session. That's one judge. <laughs> judge Charles Spurlock is one of four judges here at Roxbury District Court. Most days we have three judges in this court. We really need five. Uh, the first session is uh, on, on Mondays and Tuesdays. Really, uh, I find it an enormous burden because you have so many people locked up over a weekend. Judge Spurlock was severely criticized for rendering bail on two brothers, Robert and Edward Bendolph, both reputed gang members, in connection with a shooting in January. Bail was set at only $500. Spurlock says the police sometimes don't have their evidence in order. All it has to do with is, is the evidence that's presented in the courtroom. If they have it and have, have presented it, uh, there'll probably be a conviction or probable cause will be found. If they don't, then it won't. The other side of the squeeze on the courts is prison overcrowding. 
But for Spurlock, that isn't his concern. Prison overcrowding is, a, uh, is an issue that the legislature have to take care of. If they want to appropriate the money to, to build the prisons, then they'll do it. But I don't take that into consideration. But something that does trouble Spurlock is the number of young black men and women who come into his courtroom. Just to see him, uh, to see the wasted lives in terms of the, the kind of involvement that, that they're having with the judicial system. Uh, it's not good and, and it's... It's, it's hard. It's hard to take sometimes. Some of the bail hearings that come before Judge Spurlock often get passed on to the Suffolk Superior Court, which has the final say in setting bail and thus influencing the overcrowded situation in the jails. Artie? Lester, some of the defendants in these cases are legally juveniles. How do the police feel they should be treated in the court system? Most of the police officers that we talk to firmly believe that the hardcore individuals who are involved in gang-related violence and drug activity should be prosecuted as adults. There's an expression on the streets that if you're old enough to do the crime, you're old enough to do the time. Uh, the, uh, I suppose the, the eternal problem in, in corrections is the balance between punishment and rehabilitation. What do they say about that? Well, Judge Spurlock, who we spent a good deal of time with, said that there are some youngsters who are rehabilitatable, but those who are not, the only alternative is putting them in jail. He firmly believes that if they can't be turned around, that they ought to go. All right. Thank you, Lester Strong. Tonight in part eight of our series, Boundaries of Fear, a look at the realities and consequences of gang life. For many gang members, jail is an, an inevitable stopping point. For some, it doesn't stop them, but encourages them. Tonight, Miles O'Brien and Lester Strong take us behind bars. <laughs> It could be any prison in the Commonwealth, overcrowded and poorly maintained. This one just happens to be Deer Island. It is an inevitable stopping point for those who opt for the gang lifestyle, and the reflections of some of these inmates serves as a valuable lesson for those who consider a life of gangs, guns, and drugs. I thought it was cool. There wasn't nothing cool about this. I seen everybody else, seen it, seen everybody else rolling the drugs, so I thought, you know, man, it looked fun hey, getting Dylan, money, you know? It looked fun getting money. When you heard them closing the cell doors behind you, what was it like? What was it, uh, what was running through your mind? It was, it was, it was all over. Yeah, it was all in. Really? And, and that's right. where reality hits you in your face. You know what I'm saying? In your hand, there ain't nothing you can do about it. So just do your time, you know? At the time these pictures were taken, Deer Island had a population of about 600 inmates. It was designed for 250. And until April of this year, many inmates lived two to a cell, a six by ten foot cell. Several beds and cells, you know. One morning I wake up, I have to wait till my buddy gets up to take a wash up before I can get to the sink. We have to squeeze through each other like that, you know. Sometimes I have to sneak and get up to wash up, you know. Or we have to use the bathroom. I got to smell this odor all night, you know. If you don't take a shower or something, you know. Rough. There's work to do in the Harlems, in the Roxburys, and the Watts all over America, and don't nobody know best how to do it except you. The world waiting on you, man. He is one of the few bright spots in the lives of these 60 or so inmates. Minister Muhammad from the Nation of Islam dispenses his special brand of compassion each week, but he never fails to confront as well. I want to challenge your manhood. If you say you ain't got a job, then damn it, make one. If you can't find one, create one. Who the hell are you? You got two hands? Harsh truths that Minister Muhammad hopes will set some of these men on the right track. This is why a prison program is so critical, because it gives us a time to allow them to reflect, and hopefully we can convince them that they ought to go back to the community a whole and an improved and positive thinking individual. Massachusetts corrections officials have made a concerted attempt to keep the gangs on the streets from reforming here in the prisons, something that's virtually impossible in Los Angeles. Miles O'Brien tells us that gangs run the prisons in L.A., and what they've created is literally a graduate school in gang culture. They are the signs of gang affiliation, the signs of trouble at the Los Angeles County Jail. 
Gang members behind bars don't leave their loyalties, their hatred on the street. Once a crip, always a crip. There's been a lot of lives lost, and, and the blood runs deep. Crips in blue, bloods in red. Enemies caught in an escalating feud based on colors. You just hate him because he's wearing red. Does that make sense? In the gang world, yeah. You know. Why? Opposite side of the tracks. Opposite side of the tracks. We don't see eye to eye, just like, um, let's say, using for example, again, communism and you know, capitalism. I mean, you know, um, there's, there's the different points of view. Um, and that tends to separate people. Inside the jail, the sheriff's deputies do their best to keep the Crips and the Bloods separated. This is a Crip cell block right here. The Bloods are all the way across the other side of the jail. But separation doesn't guarantee peace. Three years ago, the overcrowded jail erupted after a guard struggled with a gang member. Marksmen had to fire rubber bullets to end the standoff. Gang members have little respect or fear for incarceration. In fact, they consider it a testing ground. This is where guys come to prove themselves. You know, this is, you know, say, so to speak, the ultimate. I mean, if you come here and you pass you know, the test, you, you make it through, then you accept it. I mean, on both fronts, here and on the outside. Did jail scare you? No. Why not? Because if you're out there doing something, you know what I'm saying, you don't have time to think about going to jail and the consequences, you know? Rick Clark is serving time for attempted murder. Will Packer is facing murder charges. Mm -hmm. Now they have plenty of time to think about the consequences of the gang feud they help perpetuate. I mean, I wish that it would just stop, period. I wish that it would just disappear. But, I mean, you know, realistically, we know that it won't disappear. But sometimes, gang members behind bars find their ingrained hatred can disappear. You know, when you've been in the penitentiary, you meet a lot of other people that you were warned against, you know, you meet and you become close due to the environment you're in. You know what I'm saying? By doing time, you know your enemy can become your best friend. Here in Boston, police say they could put a dent in the gang problem here if only the judicial system provided swift and sure punishment. But in Los Angeles, the 37 prosecutors who make up the district attorney's gang unit have an impressive 98% conviction rate. And yet they are projecting 520 gang-related homicides by the end of this year. It appears the only people deterred by jail are the ones serving time. R.D.? Thank you, Miles O'Brien. Uh, tomorrow, in Boundaries of Fear, the other victims of gang violence, the families left behind. On News 7 at 6, we'll talk with those who've lost loved ones to gang violence and who are left with nothing but memories. to be with them has came forward and said, wait, Tonight in part nine of Boundaries of Fear, an Assignment 7 report on Boston gangs, we hear from those who live with the gang violence firsthand. Some have lost loved ones. Others have come close themselves. Lester Strong and Miles O'Brien report for all the memories are haunting. And living in South Central Los Angeles is like living in Vietnam. You know, um, you constantly have to watch your back. Welcome to Sylvia Nunn's little piece of Vietnam. It's called Ludus Park. Turf claimed and protected by the Ludus Park Pyru Bloods, the street gang Sylvia helped start. They're a monster, you know. They're a monster. Were you a monster? Yeah. Hero. Somebody getting off somewhere. I mean, it don't even scare you no more. You just sit and you listen. And if the bullets seem like they're popping next to me, you just move out the way. Sylvia Nunn was squeezing triggers when most children were squeezing teddy bears. From behind her chimney, she'd shoot out the lights of police cruisers. Then on the day her older brother was shot and wounded by the rival gang, the Crips, her dangerous game became a blind rage. And I was feeling real bad. So I seeked revenge. It didn't matter who. It didn't matter who to them. So it didn't matter who to me, just one of them. Two, three, however many, however lucky I could get. I knew I was gonna get somebody, and that's what I wanted to do right then and there, and I did it. After that, it wasn't hard anymore to pull a trigger. But now Sylvia Nunn has made a separate piece. She recently married her enemy. Her husband, Maurice Robinson, is a Crip. I think that there's a lesson to be learned in your marriage, you know, that Crips and Bloods really aren't that different? Yes, there's a, one big lesson to be learned. It's, 
It's all about, to be perfectly honest, I'm be blunt. Forget about the color somebody's wearing, you know? Because what's real on the outside doesn't really matter. It's what's on the inside that, that counts. Today, me and my husband, we get along, you know, we tell each other our little war stories and, and we laugh about it, you know. And, and most of the time I'm laughing, I'm laughing to keep from crying. Sylvia says she is saddened when she know, considers what gangs have, have done to her neighborhood, together, to this park. Like Pride in turf and I colors has been tempered by remorse. I was a very sick-minded individual that was a big-ass threat to society that didn't know how to respect, that didn't know how to live in it, and didn't give a damn about it. That's what I was. I was totally insane. Here in Boston, the parks have also become pieces of turf to fight and die over. Lester Strong spoke to some people who know firsthand the pain of gang violence. He just went out like he was just going for a little joy ride. You know, some of his friends call him up, says, man, come out, and I guess, I don't know, they uh, just an incident that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The shooting death of Michael Bennett doesn't fit the profile of gang-related killings. He was a star basketball player for Hyde Park High School, had his own car, money in his pocket, and a family that loved him. But on Christmas night, Michael was found with a bullet wound to the back of the head, fired at point-blank range. It's been hard to accept. Um, truthfully, I still haven't accepted it fully that the weapon that was found on him was actually his or had he had anything to do with that. Um, the way he was found, it really disturbed me a lot. Well, I have um, talked to several youths out in the street and they have told me that when Michael wanted to get involved in the gang, they always told him, no, he cannot get involved with the gang because he was too soft. I tend to wonder, was there some sort of just trying to belong or to have a name? Glenn Williams is believed to be one of three young men in the car the night Bennett was killed. He and one other juvenile have been arraigned on Bennett's murder. It's just one more person gone. There's not a value. They do not value life. For their age, it's unbelievable. They do not value each other. Laura Johnson struggles with many of the same questions. Two of her sons have been shot in gang-related violence. And I just say to myself, this is too much. I just can't deal with it. I wish something could be done about this neighborhood because it is really bad. A lot of people would say, uh, Ms. Johnson, take these boys by the scruff of their neck and make them do right. I talk. I start talking and I talk. They just say, oh, mommy. Why don't you hush? You're so old-fashioned. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And they're going on. And I'm standing there. Or else they go in the bedroom. That's it. They don't want to listen. And I just done got to the point. I said, I talk to you. I do everything I can for you. Keep you a place to live and try to take care of you, cook your food the best I know. I'm just getting to the point. I'm just tired. And stuff like this, the shooting going in and out all the time, one is shot. You stay in upset, you just get tired of it. What's going to happen in 10 years when you say, what happened to the, 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 that younger you know, part of our generation? There's not that many left anymore. Now, no one wants the situation here to become like Los Angeles, where many feel they've already lost an entire generation. One thing we've learned doing this series is to prevent that, you have to start with the very young and show them some very viable alternatives. Andy? Lester, you've been involved in this project for six months, half a year. You've been close to it. Is, are you an optimist about, about Boston? I am an optimist about Boston for two reasons. I think that there is resolve to make this happen. But in addition to that, I think that two very critical things have to happen. First, the energy to resolve this problem still has to be focused. We talked about that on Monday. And secondly, I think people have to really understand that this is not a short-term fix. It's going to take perhaps years to really resolve the problem. Thank you. Lester Stroh. Tonight in our conclusion of Boundaries of Fear, an Assignment 7 report on gang violence, we hear the reflections of those who have made the violence part of their lives one way or the other. Miles O'Brien and Lester Strong report from the police to the judges to the ministers to the gang members. The message is the same. Stop it at now.
but it's gonna catch up to you one way or another. You always get caught. If you don't get caught, you wind up dead. But you gotta understand, cocaine can't be manufactured in the United States of America. This stuff is coming from someplace. And as long as you keep busting the paper boys, the publisher's never gonna go to jail. A lot of parents argue against uh, sex education in the schools because they feel that's a parental responsibility then it's parental responsibility to, to have them home at night and off the streets. I don't understand in a heavy, violent neighborhood until that violence is solved why there isn't a dust to dawn curfew. I'm sorry, I won't go in that street, and neither will you, but we're allowing young people to go out there. You gotta worry about your family. Mm -hmm. You could be walking down the street, you might not want your family in it, but you could be walking down the street, somebody take a shot at you, could hit your little sister, or hit your, your daughter, or whatever it may be. You don't wanna go through that. We need to take our high-tech selves, our high-tech Christian message, out of the church, onto the turf with the young people, and then begin to spoon-feed them the gospel. Little kids that are looking, seeing all the flash and dash, it only goes for so long because somebody, so, somebody out there will try to take what you have and you'll be forced to, to kill somebody, and then you just do the rest of your life in jail. It's not worth it. There needs to be more programs for these individuals, but um, there's, there's got to be some stricter control on the guns. The availability of the guns over here is, uh, is outrageous. You have to make crime in the ghettos just as wrong as crime in the nice neighborhoods. When I was growing up, we knew in our neighborhood that we could steal. I could kill another black man, but if I killed a white man or a cop, I was going to jail. When you allow that to happen in Boston or any other city, it's gonna go out of control because the kids will just continually do it. And as long as people say, well, it's just them, so what? But pretty soon, they're gonna to come to your neighborhood. Law enforcement officials and community leaders say that the drugs, the death, and the demoralizing effects of the gang culture must stop. But Miles O'Brien says that the cries to stop the madness are coming from an unexpected source as well, from within the gangs themselves. Listen to the voices of Los Angeles. A city out of control. So where you got shot, buddy? Anywhere else? So if I was you guys in the city of Boston, don't deal with it. Don't come to California and want a gang bang. It ain't worth it. It's all about money. Ain't a goddamn thing funny. If it's spreading all across the country, how, how is it going to end? How can I get away from it? If you want war, hey, go fight war. Join the army. Well, these are area maps. Uh, showing gang concentration to the tremendous uh, focus of, of gangs, so the mass group of them is in the south and south central area of Los Angeles. And I think it's much worse to stick your head in the sand. If you've got a problem, that's like if you have cancer, you don't want to go to the doctor, you don't want, don't, don't want to admit that you've got a medical problem, so you sit there and eventually you die of it. And okay, here's some guys that are, that are crossed out. <clears throat> They're gonna kill Gucci, Snoopy, and Tank from the 84th Street gang. Just, man, leave it alone. Because, you know, it's like, you, you may have a friend get killed today. That could just as easy be you tomorrow. You know I know you got guns, right? You know that, right? I think we need to go to the school systems, talk to the kids and the parents, educate the parents, educate the kids at a younger age so that they learn about gangs. There's no homework this week. Yeah. I'll see you next week. And remember. Stop! Tell the people in Boston, please address your gang situation today. Don't wait until you have 452 gang-related homicides. If you wait, it'll be too late. You have a 10-21, 10-63. Round up the ones you have in there, get them out, and don't let anyone else in. That's how I would see it. If you avoid the, the G word, if you avoid talking about gangs now, uh, you'll be forced to talk about them later. Then uh, it'll be at a time when you have a crisis on your hand. You hate bloods? We hate them. That's why, that's why we got our stoppers on. Stop the bloods? Yeah, we stop them. I would tell them to stop in Boston while it's still safe to go to the store. Stop out there while you can still play in a park. Stop out there while you can still wear what you want to wear. Stop out there while you still got a mother. You know, 
stop out there while little kids still able to play in their front yard. Stop out there while you still living. Gang violence has grown steadily in Los Angeles for the past 10 years, but the city did not mobilize any concerted effort to stop the problem until little more than a year ago. That's when black gang members from South Central Los Angeles killed a white woman in a well-to-do western suburb. It was then and only then that city leaders started taking the gang problem seriously. It's a double standard which thrusts Los Angeles into a crisis. It's a double standard Boston should avoid. On a personal note, Boundaries of Fear was a team effort involving some good professionals on the other side of the camera. Thanks go to photographers Richie Suskin, Don Nelson, and Rick Massey, editor Kathy McSweeney, and producer Kate Chaplin. Thank you, Miles O'Brien. And up next, we'll take a look at weekend weather.